Well, let's look at some examples now uh, of how to work with the relationship between the everyday and the specialized. And remember in the previous video, what we did was we made a distinction on the one side about the boundary strength of the everyday specialized being either solid, in which case you separate the two off, or open, in which, you, in which case you integrate the everyday and specialized. On the other side, we talked about the fact that in moving from the everyday to the specialized, you've got to formalize concepts and you've got to formalize combinations. And we used the work of Aristotle to illustrate that. Well, let's take a look at some examples and see if we can work out how to use those basic analytical categories to work with some examples. And the one I want to start off with is street mathematics. Now, you should immediately get a clue when you hear the term street mathematics. It sounds like on the one side you're combining the everyday world of the street with the formal world of mathematics. And this has become a very famous argument within maths. And I'd like to give a flavor of it, although I'm not going to give it justice. In this instance, this happened uh, in Brazil, although I've got a, a different photograph here. And what happened was a woman went up to a coconut boy who was selling coconuts. And she said to him, can I have 10 coconuts at 35 cents each? Now, something about that is mathematics. He's going to have to do a calculation uh, to work out how much 10 coconuts cost. And it was very interesting to see how the boy actually went about tackling this problem. So let's let's take a look at it and see see how he did it. Well, he went something like this. He said three would be 105. Now, the reason why he knew that was because he had lots of practice selling up to three coconuts. So it was common to sell three coconuts and he knew that was 105. That was kind of embedded in his in his calculating consciousness. With three more, he says that will be 210. So he's added 105 and 105. And he's done that before as well. And then he goes, I need four more. Very interesting. He knows three plus three is six. And to get to 10, he needs four more. And then he goes, that is 315. Now, what he's done there is he's actually added another 3 on to 210. So 210 plus 105 is 315. And then he goes, oh, I need one more, one more. And he goes, I think it is 350. And he's got it right. Now, who's to say that isn't mathematics? Look what he's done. He knows that 3 times 35 is 105. He knows that 105 plus 105 is 210. He knows 210 plus 105 is 315. He knows 315 plus 35 is 350. He's worked out that 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 is 10. And he also worked with 3 plus 3 is 6 plus 4 is 10. Now, that's very impressive. And, and, and what some people do who favor integrating the everyday world with the specialized world is they point out that a lot of what goes on in the specialized world is already happening in the everyday. And it's worthwhile and interesting to make sure that you pick up on that everyday world and its experiences because it makes the maths more interesting and it certainly makes it more relevant. And I, I think you can hear the power of that argument. Now, when I thought about that example, uh, I thought, what about a, a school boy or a school girl? How would they do the calculation, seeing as though my, my daughter's in a kind of primary school? And this is what she would do. She would go 35 times 10 is 350. And she'd know that automatically because all she'd do is she'd recognize the 10 and she'd say, I've got to add a zero on. She'd know a rule for that. Uh, but what she will be working with is she'll be working formally without thinking about coconuts, without thinking about anything else but the numbers on the page. It's abstract, it's formal. And what you can hear me trying to say is that it's completely separated from the everyday world. She does the calculation purely in terms of the rules of the calculation, not in terms of what needs to be done in the everyday. And it was very interesting when uh, researchers did some tests on the coconut boys and their mathematics. What they did was they went to their homes 
and asked the boys to do the same kinds of calculations and they found that when the boys weren't at the workplace where they were on the street they couldn't do the calculations as well and certainly if they gave the boys just the numbers without the coconuts if they said to them what is 35 times 10 the um, accuracy level dropped dramatically they couldn't do that they were they were stuck in that everyday world even they could, even though they could do some maths much like i would say uh, people were stuck in the cave tired at looking at shadows on the wall i don't think personally that what the coconut boy w was doing was really mathematics i think it showed numerical competence because with mathematics what you have to do is you have to build formally on rules and those rules have to build on other rules and so you build upwards ever higher in a formal way and i don't think working with the arbitrary number of 35 as the price of a coconut really gives you the basics of working with formal mathematics. But you can hear there a story about how on the one side there's a debate, do you tighten and strengthen the line between the everyday and specialized to make the specialized clear in its own terms, its own rules, and you work on those? Or do you open the line? and allow for integration and understanding and relevance to come through from the everyday into the specialized world. And, and it's a pretty powerful debate. Now the second example that you'll find uh, in the first chapter of the book has to do with the way uh, the Montessori school works with also teaching you the base 10 system. Uh, which my daughter knows by 10, 100, 1000. And what they do is they give you concrete beads. One bead, and then you get a string of beads, 10 beads. And then those 10 strings are added together to form a square of beads. And then the 10 squares are added on each other to form a cube. Now what you can hear here is on the one side they're working very tangibly with concrete beads. They can actually feel the beads. It's concrete. You don't think of abstract as necessarily having to be somewhere out there in the ether in space. You can take the abstract and you can embed it in the concrete. You can make it exist in the concrete the way that Montessori has with these beads. And the child learns how to go from uh, a base number 10 and when you say, what is 10 squared? 10 times 10. You go, oh, it's 100. But now you can actually see, concretely see a square. What is 10 cubed? 10 to the power of 3. Oh, it's 1,000. But you can see in this instance that it's a cube. So when moving from the everyday world to the specialized world, don't imagine that you have to go from just local knowledge through to abstract knowledge. It can be instead that what you decide to do is to move from a concrete world, a world you can touch and feel, but one which is already formalized, the way that uh, Montessori has done with the beads. And I think it's a very important example of how education can work from the concrete to the um, abstract, but keeping the abstract in the concrete. The final story I want to tell you is a, is a story about how uh, you move in a formalizing way. Remember we talked about going from the everyday world to the abstract world and the first move you do is you start to formalize the everyday. You start to show what the concepts are and you show what the combinations are that you work with that take you into this other abstract world. And I want to compare two mothers reading to their 18-month-old uh, kids. Now, this is an astonishing thing to think of that we do that to 18-month-old kids. But this is an example of two mothers who read very differently to the kids. So he has the first mother reading. What's that one? Yeah, chickens. Oh, look, ducks and a birdie, a birdie in a tree. There's another birdie. See the other birdie there, Kate. Hey, look, butterflies and flowers. See the flowers and a bee. Okay, it's quite cool. The mother is reading to the child. The child is learning the, f the formal conditions of what it is to take verbal sounds and convert it into um, words themselves. But the second mother, she does a very different job of it. 
And this is what she does. Firstly, she starts off, she says, look, it's a hen. Now, a hen is kind of like, that's quite interesting. You know, you've, you've got a hen and then you've got chicks, but she's given a specific term for the hen. And then she looks more closely at the hen and she gives a part of the hen, a beak, and then another part of the hen, two feet. But on top of that, she's used the number two to show that. And then she says, there's a hen with lots of little chicks. And then, strangely enough, she goes, there's a tree. And how many leaves have you got on the tree? Notice the trees are the whole, the leaves are the parts, she's broken it down. And then she gives the formal counting system, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way up to 16 leaves. And she compares the 16 leaves to 16 little birds. So not only is she working with the situation where she's working with the whole of something like a hen and breaking it down into its parts, She's also starting to show how you can compare different kinds of things in terms of their numbers and see how they can be similar in terms of numbers, in terms of how many there are. So she's starting to work in an abstract world. And she does it again when she says, and look at these birds here. There are two big ones and two more big ones and there are two very big ones. She's starting to work with size. She's starting to work with the abstract concept of size. So what you have to understand with this example is that some mothers are very concerned about making sure that their kids move from the everyday world into the specialized world as quickly as possible because they know that education is important for the future life of the kid. Whereas other mothers are more concerned about making sure that their kids just live in the world that they are in a happy and a secure way. And therein lies the tale of how inequalities in education can actually grow and spread um, through the way that mothers uh, educate their children. But that is another story which I'll tell at a different time.